Uh, well, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, finer, final speaker uh, of the session, Stephen Morse. Uh, uh, Stephen came up to me uh, beforehand and said, uh, you know, I'm standing between them and a drink. Uh, and I said, yes, but you're exactly the guy that's going to hold their attention through that. And he said, no problem. So we're going to hold them to that. So uh, Stephen's, uh, 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 as many of you know, from the uh, University of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, he's a recipient of the American Academy of Forensic Psychology's uh, Distinguished uh, Contributor Award. Uh, he's uh, 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 the author of uh, uh, many um, uh, books, uh, and uh, you know, one, for example, on, uh, uh, which was on uh, crime and culpability, a theory of criminal law. Uh, uh, certainly in addressing the issues of culpability uh, harkens back to some uh, comments I made uh, uh, in the uh, very morning about how neuroscience can uh, relate to that. But um, uh, one of his um, uh, most notable contributions from my perspective was a collaboration he did with a former colleague of ours, Adina Roski, who worked in the lab uh, many years ago, uh, uh, where he uh, co-edited a book with her on a, a primer for criminal law and neuroscience. Uh, and it's uh, presumably at that uh, interface that he's going to uh, share uh, his thoughts, uh, uh, encouraging or otherwise, uh, with us uh, uh, this afternoon. Stephen. Well, first, thank you everybody for having me. I'm really honored to be here. After all the high-level science you've been hearing today, uh, this is gonna be like a horsey and a ducky in a bathtub, so uh, you'll forgive me for that. What I'm hoping to do in the time allotted before you get to start drinking is to give you a framework for thinking about these issues. Now, one of the things I told Gary Boas was that Josh Buckholz and I were a good tag team. You will not believe it when you hear my presentation. We did not talk about this ahead of time. We did not, and yet you will hear many of the same things. You can do that, but you'd be doing something invalid. All right. <laughs> now, great minds think alike. I have been using this quote that Bruce started off with this morning since uh, 2002, when it appeared in, as many of you probably know, The Economist does not call itself a magazine. It calls itself a newspaper. So it appeared in The Economist newspaper. And, you know, we would all concede, or I think most of us would, if these things happened, that would be a very, very bad thing indeed. Well, here's what I'm here to tell you. They're not going to happen, not by genetics, not by neuroscience, maybe not ever, certainly not anytime soon, so you can all relax, take a deep breath, get over it. All right, now, a couple of things to start. Uh, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me, not for a minute. I am a physicalist, and I am not a dualist. I'm a monist. You try to talk non-dualistically. In fact, if you all neuroscientists who think of yourselves as hard-nosed scientists who are not dualists were to hear a transcript of what you said today, there were so many little homunculi running around in your brains doing things as if they were independent agents separate from you, the human being. We all talk that way. It's unavoidable. It doesn't mean you're a dualist. Uh, when I say multi-field, uh, multi-level, what I'm saying there is if we ever want to explain almost any complex bit of human behavior, you can't do it from any one level of explanation. You're going to need to have biological variables and at different levels of biology. You're going to need to have psychological variables from different levels of psychology, similarly for sociology. And you know what the mix will be for how much explanatory power you get will depend on what it is you're trying to explain. But with human behavior, it's certainly going to be multi-field, multi-level if you want to get it all. 
Now, what I'm going to be talking about largely is cognitive, affective, and social neuroscience. Why is that? Because the neuroscience that's going to be most useful to the law or to any other kind of social function is going to be this neuroscience having to do with behavior as opposed to the underlying basic neuroscience. Now, obviously, those two things are related. You don't get social, cognitive, or affective neuroscience unless things are going on at a lower level, clearly. But what I'm suggesting is most of the work you're going to want to be doing is at the social, affective, and cognitive, at least for the foreseeable future. Now, my thesis is, at this point, there's more hype than hope. And this is very much consistent with much of what Josh Buchholz has properly told you already. I think I agree with 99% of what he said. I would just point out one thing. In 1883, the great criminal law theorist, historian, pamphleteer, Sir James Fitzjames Stevens, by the way, Virginia Woolf's uncle, in his great history of the criminal law of England, said this about control tests in the law. You know what a control test is? Can a person keep future consequences present to their mind? 1883, and this was a guy who wouldn't have known a microscope from a horoscope. Okay, now what the field has been bedeviled by, and Josh has already um, alluded to, is what I call brain overclaim syndrome. Now I first uh, wrote this up in a paper in 2006, and I suggested a bunch of provisional diagnostic criteria and recommended cognitive gerotherapy as a safe and non-invasive, non-intrusive therapy for the mistakes that people were making about the relevance of neuroscience to criminal law especially, but to law in general. And when I reviewed what has happened in 2013 and changed the provisional criteria somewhat in a later article, what I discovered was there had been no diminution whatsoever in how much brain overclaim syndrome there was despite the easy availability of cognitive gerotherapy. But there it is. Now, people have talked about history, so I thought I'd tell you just a bit of history about neural law before getting into the meat and heart of this. There were people prior to, let's say, 1991 and two, which is where it all began, who had talked about the brain and the law. But as you all know, we didn't know much that would be very legally relevant. You don't need to be a lawyer to know that. Yes, certain neurological disorders well characterized, well understood, like epilepsy could certainly affect criminal behavior sometimes, not very frequently, and that wasn't the new neuroscience, that was the old neurology. So what happened? In 1991, a 62-year-old retired advertising executive in New York City, 62 years old, got into an argument with his wife. He was known then as Spider Siskoff, you'll understand why in a second. His wife was called Brunhilde. They got into a fight, an argument about their kids by the first marriage, your kid's a dork, no, your kid's a dork, and he finally strangled her to death and threw out their 12-story window, which the New York City police took a very dim view of, as did the New York City district attorney, and he was charged with murder. Well, he was worked up first by Fred Plum at uh, New York Hospital, and they discovered this humongous subarachnoid cyst pressing on his left frontal cortex. So they sent him out to Alberto de Maceo, then at Iowa, now at USC, who worked him up and said, ah, this is just like my somatic marker hypothesis guy. This guy can't control himself. And this was going to lead to a, um, an insanity defense claim based on exactly one of the standards Josh Buckholz told you about, couldn't conform his conduct the requirements of law. Fabulous lawyers on both sides, fabulous experts. Finally, he pled guilty the night before trial, went to prison for a lesser included offense of manslaughter, did seven years in prison. In 1993, the American um, Neuropsychiatric Association at their annual meeting decided to have a plenary session devoted to Spider Siskoff, who by the way then was already known by his real name, Herbert Weinstein, and his wife was Barbara Weinstein. Spider Siskoff, subarachnoid cyst, anyhow. Cutesy, cutesy. All right, so, and they got the original lawyers and the original experts to do this plenary session, but they decided they needed an academic expert. Well, there was no academic expert from law. So they said, get me. Why me? Because I do forensic psychiatry and I do forensic psychology. I'm both a lawyer and a psychologist. I'm a board-certified forensic psychologist, board-certified clinical psychologist, and I can do this stuff. But I said, I don't know enough about this stuff. They said, you'll have six months to learn it. So I read up everything there was. And this is just 
as the apocal experiments you were hearing about this morning were being developed. So even from fMRI, almost nothing was available. But so I wrote my first article, 1995, called Brain and Blame, based on this. And there I was. Now, what really got it started around the year 2000, guess what happened? You heard Bruce say this morning, any psychology department without a magnet is a second rank place. Well, starting around 2000, lots of departments got scanners, at which point they could start to do the studies, at which point you see, in social, cognitive, and effective, you see a logarithmic increase in the number of studies, and the law professoriate and judges and hangers on, they're always looking for the new thing that's going to solve the hard problems law decides. And this was going to be neuroscience. And then you already saw the slide. I can, well, let me go through my slides really quickly and get to it towards the end. <laughs> this is going to be real. Oh, there he is. Hold on. Whoops. Oop. Ah, OK. So you saw this before. This is the guy who had acquired pedophilia from the archives of neurology study. That, by the way, is a right orbital frontal hemangiopericytoma. Uh, and the argument was, look, his brain made him do it. He would not have had pedophilic urges. He would not have molested his stepdaughter if it hadn't been for this tumor. And we knew this for, from time series reasons. We had really good causal inferences. And everyone said, see, his brain made me do it. It made him do it. This is just the modal case. Well, if we have time when I'm done, I want to go back to this case, and I want to show you that it doesn't lead to that inference, that despite having a tumor without which he would not have done the things he did, he might very well have been responsible for himself. And here's the way I'm going to tee this up for you. How do you discover what is the object of your sexual desire? John Gabrielli and I were talking about this at lunch. How do you decide what it is? You don't look at a list of everything from shoes to goats to adult people when you're in your teens and say, ah, I think I'll be a pedophile. No, you discover pretty much that you are. What pedophile is quote unquote responsible in any coherent way for the sexual desires he has? And the answer is none. Was this guy, where the tumor produced his pedophilic desires, responsible for his pedophilic desires? No. He was dealt a very unlucky hand. In his case, we know why. The tumor. In the case of most pedophiles, we don't know why. But it's an unlucky hand either way. Because what you want is both illegal and immoral. And you know it. So, <clears throat> but it's not a crime to have pedophilic urges. It is a crime to touch a child. And the fact that you have the urge does not mean you cannot control that urge. That's the question for the law, and we will return to it pretty soon. All right, hold on. Believe it or not, I'm going to get through this in reasonable amount of time. Where am I? Ah, yes, there we are. OK, so what is law? Let me be breathtakingly superficial really breathtakingly, but good enough for government work for our purposes. Because if we're going to ask the question, what does neuroscience or any other science have to contribute to the law, we have to have a sense of what the law is. What is it that we're trying to relate what we're doing to? So let me be, as I said, breathtakingly superficial. Law is a series of rules and standards that are meant to guide behavior. Law does other things as well. It creates value and stuff like that. But it's meant to be an action-guiding tool. In that respect, it's like morality. It's like custom. It's like social norm. It's like etiquette. It gives us a reason to behave one way as opposed to another. Right? That's what law is. Law is action-guiding, and action-guiding by reason. You know, to the best of our knowledge, Dogs don't have legislators, pigs don't have police, uh, dolphins and chimpanzees don't have, you know, codes of morality and the like. Only human beings do in the fully fledged way of having the capacity to act for reasons. So that's what law is. Now, law has an implicit psychology and concept of the person. 
And here, what I'm going to give you is an interpretation, a goodness of fit interpretation. So I'm not, there's no tablet in the sky that says, here's the laws concept of the person in psychology. This is a goodness of fit, a reverse interpretation. OK? Let's think about what kind of creature can be guided by reason, because that's what law does. It gives you reason to act one way or the other by setting a bunch of rules and standards. It's a folk psychological creature, a creature whose mental states matter to how they act. Now, let me make a distinction for you here very quickly between folk psychology as an explanatory, partial explanation, causal explanation of human behavior, and folk psychology as a bunch of accumulated bits of wisdom, like kids are different from adults. So, and I do this, by the way, in rooms of neuroscientists all the time, why are you sitting here in this room today? That why question is one, you can't ask Fido, you can't ask Flipper, you can't ask the chimp, you can only ask another human being. Why are you sitting here today? None of them ever tells me a neuroscience story. They all want to tell you a folk psychological story about their mental state. So, I desired to celebrate the 25th year of fMRI. I desired to see my friends. I desired to take a day off from work. I believe that coming to this conference would do one of those things, all of those things, other things too that I desired to achieve. And I formed the intention to be here, and here I am. That's folk psychology. It explains human beings causally but only partially, in terms of their mental states. Now, philosophers, neuroscientists, psychologists argue about what those mental states are, how they should be individuated, but all you are committed to if you're a folk psychologist is mental states matter. Desires, beliefs, intentions, plans, things like that, <clears throat> okay? All legal criteria are mental state and act criteria. Virtually all. And in criminal law, that's 100%. So let me give you an example. Murder on one theory, and uh, Josh is an example of a murderer, I believe. On one theory, it's an intentional killing action, a shooting, a knifing, where I do a shooting or a knifing intentionally, done with the purpose to kill. So what do I have to prove to prove that I'm guilty of murder? You have to prove that I intentionally did some killing action, like I intentionally shot a gun, or I intentionally you know, knifed, and I did it with the purpose of killing somebody. That's murder. Acts and mental states. All right, now. Here we go. The question of relevance. This is the most important question. Here is what I am going to assume from now on. And sometimes it's counterfactual, very often it's not that the science people want to use is good science. In the case of imaging, the image has been properly acquired and it's been properly evaluated. I'm just going to assume away for now those problems. The question you always want to ask is how precisely you've got a bunch of criteria that are act and mental state criteria, how precisely does this neuro data help answer that question? Now, what my philosopher friends say, no hand-waving allowed. See, he's got a broken brain. That's a hand-wave. Show me precisely the chain of inference that gets you from these neurodata to the legal question you are trying to answer. Now, psychology and psychiatry, interestingly enough, are in a better position to do the translation. Now, why is that? Because psychology and psychiatry sometimes treat you like a hunk of meat, and sometimes they treat you like an acting human being. To the extent they treat you like an acting human being, it's narrative stuff about your life. It's about your folk psychology. So it shares that with law. Neurons don't got stories. The connectome doesn't got stories. It doesn't have aspirations. It doesn't have a sense of past, present, and future, et cetera, et cetera. Neuroscience is a mechanistic science. Psychiatry and psychology, at least in part, are folk psychological. So for those of you who may know something about the therapeutic trade, if let's say you assume you suffer from depression, but you go to your pill doc, and she says any side effects, and all she wants to talk about is you as a hunk of meat, fire her. You want someone who also is going to treat you as an acting human being. How's it going at home? How's it going at work? 
How are you feeling? Right? All right. So it's a very, very hard translation to do. When you have that translation, here's a major take home message. Actions speak louder than images. Because whenever there is, and I'm going to hold aside cases of malingering. They're a special problem. I just want to bracket them. Holding aside cases of malingering, if you see a disjunct between any kind of scientific data and the agent's real world behavior, it's the real world behavior that's going to be most relevant because the law's criteria are behavioral, as Josh Buckholz correctly told you. So I have some examples of that. For the physicians in the room, it's obvious. Lots of people with severe back pain who aren't malingering have good looking spines and people with terrible looking spines don't have back pain. Well, suppose someone's in an industrial accident and they also have a crappy looking spine. They say, I, I've got a disability, I can't work anymore. It hurts too much. But the insurance investigator smells a rat and investigates and guess what? The person exercises on a trampoline. They don't got debilitating back pain. I'm sorry, I don't care how bad the back looks. Uh, psychosis in brains, although we are now starting to make inroads in being able to distinguish, although not yet with sufficient sensitivity to actually use it clinically, between people with, let's say, psychotic disorders and non. Look, we've known people are psychotic for thousands of years. We may have used different words over time. We've known that behaviorally. I don't care how good a person's brain looks. If they're acting psychotically, they're psychotic. Similarly, I don't care how bad the person's brain looks, if they're acting rationally, they're not psychotic. And in the juvenile trilogy that Bruce alluded to, by the way, in those three cases, the first one did not cite neuroscience. It just cited behavioral science. The second two cited neuroscience in a very, very vague way. They didn't need to. It was more rhetorically relevant than it was actually relevant, because from the behavioral studies alone, we knew that adolescents are different behaviorally. Now, it was nice that the diffusion tensor imaging converged with the behavioral imaging, the behavioral studies, but imagine the following. Imagine we didn't have DTI yet, or the DTI wasn't nearly as sophisticated as it has become, and we couldn't find any difference between adolescent brains on average and adult brains on average. Would we conclude that there is no difference between adolescents and adults? No, we'd conclude just the opposite. The neuroscience yet wasn't sophisticated enough to pick up those differences. And since the criteria for adolescent culpability are behavioral, it was the behavioral stuff that was really doing the work. All right, here's the case for cautious op optimism. And how much longer do I have, Bruce? Well, no, you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> 10 minutes, all right. Can everyone sit for 10? All right, maybe. <laughs> okay. First, four things that I think neuroscience could potentially do. The law bases a lot of criteria on folk wisdom. So for instance, people are assumed, as we say in law, presumed to intend the natural and probable consequences of their actions. Well, maybe neuroscience or other sciences could show that that is not true and a presumption that the prosecutor often uses in criminal cases, for instance, shouldn't be used. We're not there yet, but possibly. Evaluate doctrines and policies. Um, Josh Buckholz talked a lot about self-control problems. Control tests for legal insanity are extremely controversial. They're just a minority of jurisdictions now. Maybe neuroscience could show us that there is a stronger case for control tests. Uh, the American Psychiatric and the American Bar Association both have ar ur urged their abolition in the early 1980s and have never gone back from that position, but maybe neuroscience could show us that. Thirdly, it might assist with individual case adjudication. Is it the case, for instance, that this person who's claiming legal insanity is suffering from a major mental disorder or not? We can't do that now. Maybe very shortly, you saw a very interesting presentation two presentations ago by Sue Whitfield Gabrielli that suggests who knows in the near future on that. And then, as Josh Buckholt said, we can contribute to the efficiency and fairness in the operation of criminal and civil justice. My examples here are prediction. Josh has already talked about it. 
A lot of civil libertarians are afraid, what if we get real good at prediction? I say, look, we use prediction all the time now. We already think it's justified. You tell me if we already think it's justified, what's the argument for doing it worse as opposed to doing it better? The rational argument for doing it worse. You could give me a non-rational argument for doing it worse. That'd be true. Uh, by the way, the one thing I would say about the proof of concept, and I do think it is a proof of concept study that Josh talked about, the uh, Haroni et al., is it did not use quote unquote gold standard behavioral methods. And when Russ Poldrack reanalyzed the data, what he found was for violent crimes, it seemed to go away. For property crimes, predicting rearrest, it didn't go away. There is one other study by Pardini et al. that comes to the same thing. You've heard about in psychiatry, various prediction studies. Uh, John Gabrielli did a study years ago with Boston School children that showed that <clears throat> fMRI data predicted who was going to benefit from a school reading disability program with two and a half years of treatment as usual, much better than any kind of behavioral measure or combination of behavioral measures. Objective pain measurement. Pain and suffering in the civil justice system is a multi-billion dollar business. If we could get objective measurements, that would be a game changer. And there are people working on it in labs in the United States and abroad. Evaluation of memory accuracy, one of John Gabrielli's studies, who, uh, students who many of you know, Anthony Wagner, is doing as part of MacArthur Foundation a project I've been part of for 10 years, doing really interesting work showing that perhaps, subject to countermeasure problems, we can do with machine learning, we can do fabulously good at predicting whether a memory is accurate or not. Okay, more on cautious optimism. There are many people out there who want to do radical challenges based on neuroscience. They're the worst brain overclaimers, as far as I'm concerned. The first thing they think is neuroscience has shown that determinism is true. No science can show that determinism is true. It's a working hypothesis of many of us, or something like neurodeterminism is a working hypothesis for many of us. I will just wave my hand at this problem, even though I said before, no hand waving. There are fabulous philosophical arguments, in fact, the dominant among the philosophers of, of responsibility, to say we can be agents, we can be responsible, even if determinism is true. Whether the determinism is neurodeterminism, genetic determinism, neuro is just the newest kid on the block. There is a more radical ch challenge that some people are saying, we're not agents at all. We're just a pack of neurons, or just welcome my brother and sister victims of neuronal circumstances. It's not even your brain doing it, it's subroutine. I'm, okay, all I have to say about that one is there isn't a plausible scientific claim to be made for it based on what we know today. And the major scientific experiments that allegedly have given fuel to this have been thoroughly exploded in the last five or six years both empirically and conceptually. So if you've got really, it goes bump in the night worries about neuroscience, stop worrying, be happy. Okay, here's, here's the downer. Whoops. All right. The sad fact is, and we all admit this to ourselves, we go to sleep when no one else is listening, we don't know how the brain enables the mind. We don't know how action is possible. Now, obviously, for having mental states, you've got to have a brain. Your brain is dead. You're not of much legal interest. Uh, you have to have an intact neuromuscular system to be able to act. OK, that's all true. We know all that. And we know a lot of the pathologies that prevent those things. But at the basic level, we don't know how the brain enables the mind. And as my buddy Steve Hyman is fond of saying, one of the reasons that you're not seeing any new psychiatric drugs recently, as opposed to just twinking uh, or tweaking of molecules that already are successful that were discovered serendipitously, is because we really don't know how the brain enables the mind, and the drug companies don't want to spend billions going on fishing expeditions. There'll be a revolution, I think, in our understanding of ourselves if we can ever do that, but I'm not sure we can ever do that. In fact, there are a group of philosophers out there known as Mysterians, believe it or not, who believe that the problem is so hard that human beings can't solve it. They don't mean it's not in principle solvable, it's just we're not smart enough to solve it, and maybe never will. How this, you know, two and a half pound chunk of gray and white jelly produces consciousness and intentionality, that's a hard problem. Okay. Most of these are familiar to you, uh, so 
I don't want to waste much time with them. I will just go through some that you may not have thought of much before yourself. Here's the clear cut problem. And this is, this is the G2I problem that Josh Buckholz referred to. When people are doing cognitive, let me just use cognitive or social or effective neuroscience, they don't go on fishing expeditions. Many of you may know the scanning of the dead Atlantic salmon study that, you know, you lower the filter enough, you get activity, but okay. Neuroscientists have already developed a subject that interests them. How are people suffering from schizophrenia different from those who don't have it? How are people who are impulsive different from those who don't have it? And they're looking for neural correlates maybe, sometimes if they've got the technique causation. But notice what's happened. They already have, behaviorally, a clear group of experimental subjects. And they've got a clear group, behaviorally, of comparison or control subjects. They didn't need the neuroscience. And what happens then? First of all, you get overlaps between the, tur uh, the curves, even when you have the clear cut between your two groups, behaviorally. And still, you have so much overlap in the data that, for example, you can't diagnose major mental disorder yet using brain imaging because it's not sufficiently sensitive. Okay, but we didn't need, let's say in the courtroom, we didn't need the brain image to know who's really psychotic, assuming no malingering, and who isn't. What about the case where we're not sure, the gray area case? That's the case where we need the help the most and where the neuroscience helps, I'm sorry to say, least because there the overlap between the curves is going to be complete or almost complete. And until we get vastly more precise measures than we have now, we're not going to be able to solve that. I just want to point out how few studies there are that are legally relevant in neuroscience. You know, when you go to apply to the various um, grant people, there's not a box for law and neuroscience. And it's just hard to get money to do that kind of work. That's why the work that Josh Buckholz and his colleagues have done is, is, is really so fantastic. I mean, they, they went and they did some very, very interesting studies that were arguably legally relevant, when it's very hard to get uh, money for that. Think about, you know, so Josh talked about, let's Stroop test in the scanner. So who are the subjects of that? College students. Obviously, your average on-street thug when deciding to mug that mark or not. I mean, it's a problem of ecological validity. The major problem, however, when it comes to law, where the rubber really hits the road, people's lives, our society is going to be so affected, is lack of replication. Don't we, before we want to change legal policy, before we want to revolutionize the law, wouldn't we want to be very, very sure from many studies that we had a finding that one was legally relevant and two, we were sure was robustly true. And without lots of replications, you ain't going to get there. And nobody, you, you're, many of you are either working scientists or training to be working scientists. You know the political economy of your field. No one wants to give you money to do what the other guy did. And you don't make your career doing what the other guy did. You make your career and get your money by doing something no one's done before. So you don't spend your time replicating. All right. Very briefly, there are now five studies, empirical studies, that um, <clears throat> have looked at the reception of neuroscience evidence in the courts in five different places. The short form is most of the good stuff is the old neurology or the old neuropsychology. It's not the new neuroscience. It's not the new neuroimaging. Most of the time when it's admitted, it's admitted with no real attention to relevance or with hand-waving about relevance. It is a mess out there. And just to give you a sense of that, and I'll conclude, in 2013, Bill Newsom of Stanford, who's known to, I'm sure, many of you, and I went through all the doctrines, every single discrete doctrine of criminal law, and we looked at all the neuroscience there was, and it wasn't that different in 2013 from what it is today. And we concluded that except for a couple of well-characterized old neurological conditions, dementias, epilepsy, and the like, there was 
no neuroscience yet ready to be relevant in criminal law work. None yet. Now, that could change tomorrow. We don't know what's going to come out of the laboratories. This is, I fear, when I say deja vu all over again, psychiatry and psychology in the courtroom were a mess. And now I fear the same mistakes that were made there are going to be made with neuroscience. All right, we don't have time, so I can't tell you why I think Mr. Oft might, Oft, by the way, for orbital frontal tumor. We don't know his real name. I know his first name now is Michael, but I still don't know his real last name. I called him Mr. Oft. It, got, it stuck in the literature. That was my one claim to fame. Uh, uh, too bad I can't talk about it. So here are my conclusions. We're acting agents. We're not Pinocchios, and our brains are not Geppettos. Folk, psycholog folk psychology and agency are secure, at least for now. Jerry Fodor is a great, incredibly neuroscientifically well-informed philosopher of mind and action who said, everything's going to be all right, and I think he's right. More modestly, we await more legally relevant neuroscience that may prove to be useful in the four ways described earlier in the case for cautious optimism. And it's all unthinkable that even that would be possible without fMRI, so thanks to all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, OK, uh, extremely provocative. Uh, and uh, at the very least, uh, either a uh, charge to uh, get uh, even more serious uh, with our work or a charge to go out and have a drink uh, <laughs> and be glad that we're doing basic neuroscience and not uh, you know, facing you on the other side of uh, the bar. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, although I do have some questions uh, to raise, uh, but uh, we'll uh, discuss them over, uh, over drinks in just a minute. So with that, I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, being here for the day. Uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, the point of this is a celebration, so uh, please, uh, you know, stay as long as you can and help us uh, celebrate, uh, you know, this great occasion. Thanks again to all our speakers and to all of you. <laughs>